Hello and welcome back to another edition of Wellness Wednesday, where we share practical wellness tools and techniques from experts on the topics that are important to patients, survivors, and caretakers alike. I'm Erin Kuhn Krieger, and I'm so excited to be back today hosting this edition of Wellness Wednesday, where we're going to be featuring cannabis nurse Rebecca Abraham from Acute On Cancer, excuse me, Acute On Chronic. Rebecca has a lot of great information to share today, so I want to jump right in. A quick reminder before we do that our Dashing Together uh, is taking place on Saturday, July 10th, and I hope that everyone will virtually join us in support of Ralph's mission to provide personal support to those affected by pancreatic cancer through tailored resources, connections and education, and funding for early detection, detection research. Register at dashingtogether.com. And don't forget, you could ask questions throughout our session. We'll be saving them until the end to make sure that Rebecca could get to all of them. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Abramson, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, Rebecca, a registered nurse and founder and president of Acute On Chronic. Welcome. Hi. I'm just going to start jumping right into my slides because I do a nice intro there. Uh, going to screen share, but it's nice to meet everyone. I'm Rebecca Abraham. I'm a registered nurse. Um, my letters behind my name are RNBSN. I'm a former critical care nurse. I've done case management, worked in the ER, surgical services. I've done policy. I've done patient advocacy. I've done government advocacy, advocacy nurse lobbying. So I've kind of done a lot in healthcare. Um, I love learning new things, and that's what brought me to cannabis. I love the challenge of a new science and building a new nursing specialty. So I'm going to just begin by sharing sharing. So understanding the world of cannabis, disclosure statement, I do own a business. Um, it is proprietary. Um, I have no other affiliations or financial interests to disclose. Um, so your first question is probably, what the heck is a cannabis nurse? I've never heard of that. This is bonkers. What could this possibly be? Um, so a cannabis nurse, we have many associations, as you could see, there's the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, there's the American Cannabis Nurse Association, um, and Cannabis Nurse Network, there's also Normal, um, and about a dozen other uh, cannabis related and healthcare related professional industry uh, groups that one can join. Um, the American Cannabis Nurse Association started in 2010. There are actually cannabis nurses before me. I'm an early adopter, um, but there are even earlier pioneers in this industry. So if you're a nurse out there and you're interested in cannabis, definitely check them out. Um, it's a great organization and literally building this entire specialty from the ground up. So what do I do? I provide an you're gonna see a lot of what I do in this talk, um, but I provide a nursing assessment. I provide a nursing cannabis care plan. I provide lots of education, more um, education than you can imagine. I kind of take you to nursing school and uh, biology and we come back. Um, care navigation and coordination with your healthcare team. That's if you're hospitalized, I'll and my nurses and my team will communicate with your team inside the hospital and out. But also with your cannabis care, we will absolutely collaborate with your physician and healthcare team if that's something you want. If it's something you don't want, we do not, but we always encourage somebody to find a cannabis doctor or cannabis specialist or cannabis provider to work with long-term. Uh, we do patient advocacy. So if you're in the hospital and you want a third party set of eyeballs checking on things to see that, you know, basics of care being followed. We provide that service. Uh, we do government lobbying and cannabis consulting. Um, I've testified in front of city council, state reps, and even, um, you know, federal lobbying as well. And then we help save you money. Cannabis can get expensive. So we will help you get a card. We will help you use cannabis in a cost efficient way and provide you any resources you need to grow your own, get your card, um, anything you can imagine related to cannabis and healthcare, we can provide you. So that's just even just a dip in the bucket of what we do. Um, I also want to talk about how cannabis works on our bodies, so the endocannabinoid system. I want to talk about some adverse effects that you could feel or contraindications. So cannabis interacts with a lot of drugs. But don't worry, we'll jump right into it. Um, a literature review of how cannabis can help oncology patients and pancreatic cancer patients as well. And then safety considerations for you and what to tell your doctor and care team. So this is kind of the landscape of cannabis. Um, there are actually hundreds of products. So if you think about cannabis, as you know, 
Um, it's more than you could actually imagine. Folks in the industry are aware that there's thousands of products, but it's available to be consumed in many, many different ways. You have waxes, which is up here, this kind of yellow stuff. You have chocolates, you have gummies, you have lotions, you have transdermal patches, there's sprays, there's sodas, there's melt away tablets, there's bath bombs, there's so many ways to consume your cannabis. Um, cannabis total, so it, cannabis is an overarching new term. Um, that is the plant genus that cannabis comes from. If you think of kind of your citrus fruit, follow along with me. So you have cannabis, like you have citrus fruit. And then imagine how you have lemons and oranges. So imagine hemp is your lemons and THC cannabis is your orange. And THC cannabis is formerly known as marijuana. Um, and then down from there in about each bucket of those plant genuses, you have about a thousand different strains made up of various cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, don't worry, I'm going to address what the heck those are because those are probably, if you're a new cannabis user, you're new to cannabis, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So those are chemicals and the essential oils of cannabis. Um, and within the scope of cannabis, there's about thousands of strains. So the history of cannabis, um, why is it even illegal in the first place? Something must be wrong with cannabis, right? No. Um, cannabis has been used um, as a medicinal substance since early China in 2500 BC. It is used as a medicinal substances um, in early human cultures. It's used in India. It's used in Uganda. It's used in the Middle East. Um, it's used in Turkey. It's used by European nomadic tribes. Um, it's used in the Roman Empire. It comes to the Americas um, in the 1600s. Um, in the 1600s, uh, the constitution is actually written on hemp paper. Hemp was one of the biggest imports uh, that America had. That's how our economy was built. Hemp and tobacco were two of our biggest exports and imports. Um, Thomas Jefferson actually used to smoke hemp to relieve his migraines. Um, most of the founding fathers used hemp as well. So what the heck happened? Um, we move along through history. There is a very sad side to cannabis as well. So cannabis is brought over um, also as a recreational substance for slaves and indentured servants with coffee to endure very harsh working conditions. Eventually, it's also used as a recreational substance as a medicine by choice by indigenous people um, and all people alike. And then it's picked up by the scientific community and doctors in around the 1850s in America and Europe um, and used just like we use medicine. So um, cannabis cigarettes were used for asthma. It's actually a really potent bronchodilator. Uh, it was a really great treatment for dysentery, cholera, pain control. It was used in childbirth. So it was a really top go-to substance for physicians for a very long time. What happened? Uh, so in the around 1920s, you have alcohol becoming criminalized and then decriminalized. And you have two prominent men. You have Andrew Mellon and Randolph Hearst. Mr. Hearst owns a newspaper, but he also owns paper. Uh, Mr. Mellon has a lot of money in DuPont chemicals. They appoint Mr. Mellon, who's the secretary of the treasury. They appoint him um, and his relative to become the first director of the DEA. And these two men want to make more money and hemp is in the way. So what do they do? Um, they use racism as a tool to get mar marijuana at the time, marijuana tax act, but cannabis banned. They plucked a word out of obscurity. Marijuana was a slang used um, by indigenous and Latino and Latina farm workers. They pulled it out of nowhere. No one knew what marijuana was. They assumed it was a new dangerous substance. Hearst owned the media. They printed that over and over and over again. Um, they had a congressional hearing on it. By the time the AMA figured out what was going on, they figured out, wait, this bad substance that makes everyone do bad things is actually cannabis. Oh no, we have to go testify. And they testified two days before the hearing closed and it failed. Um, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 passes. It passed as an amendment under a Stamp Act, that Stamp Act was never used, and that is how cannabis was made illegal today. Um, so no scientific reason for cannabis to be illegal. There has been no reported deaths from cannabis. It was essentially because two corporation moguls wanted to make more profit, and hemp looks like cannabis. It looks like THC cannabis, so it all got bunched together. 
Um, I begin my talk uh, with a patient I had. So 42 year old female with triple negative metastatic breast cancer referred to me from a, her palliative haven nurse navigator from a university medical center. Um, I met her, she was very sick during her first interview. She was actively vomiting. Um, she told me she was in lots of pain. She had to stop her immunotherapy infusions because she could no longer tolerate it. She was not eating food. She was sleeping all the time. Um, she was no longer working, but she did have two very young children um, that she wanted to spend time with. She wanted to participate in her family life. She wanted to just do anything. And she said the basics of what she was doing was sleeping all day, um, not eating, vomiting most of the time. And she was just able to perform activities of daily living, like getting dressed, waking up, and that was kind of it for her. So we're going to just think about this story. She was on every pharmaceutical you can imagine. So how does cannabis work? Um, a lot when clients and patients hire me, they'll go through their list of problems. They'll say, you know, I have constipation. I'm anxious. I can't sleep. I'm in pain. I have diabetes. I have hypertension. And I say, you know, cannabis can help with that. And then I say it over and over again. Uh, they do look at me like I'm insane. And you're probably looking at your computer screen in the same exact way. Um, however, um, cannabis can help with about 20 to 30 different things. Um, the research is still growing and I know we're going to find out more things and more concrete things, but how does it work? So there's something called the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system was discovered in about 1990. Think of it like the endorphin system. That's the system that opioids act on when you run, you know, you trigger a runner's high, that's your endorphin system. Flight or, fight or flight works on that same system as well. So within our body in the central nervous system, we have CB1 receptors. That's where cannabis acts on. We also have CB2 receptors that are abundant throughout other organ systems. These two um, receptors talk to each other. And so our neurologic system is connecting to all of our other organ systems, but these receptors are abundant in every organ system, skin, liver, brain, stomach, intestines, vascular system, it's everywhere. Um, the really important thing to know about this system is it has one really useful tool. And these receptors are not in our abdulla oblongala. What's that? That is the part of our very early brain stem that controls all of the basic functions of life. So breathing, heart rate, that kind of thing. Um, alcohol, opioids, benzodiazepines, there are receptors in that particular place in our brain. Um, and that's how those things can kill people, stopping respiration, stopping our heart. Cannabis cannot do that because the receptors do not exist in that part of our brain. What else makes the endocannabinoid system really unique and warrant of much more research? Uh, on the cellular level, uh, the cells flow backwards. So most of our neurotransmitters flow presynaptic to postsynaptic. The endocannabinoid system flows the complete opposite way. Other things we've learned about it is it's also in most animal life. It's in a lot of plant life. Um, it's also likely that it was in prehistoric humans and that it's a very early part of our biology. This is why it's likely tied to things like pain, food, sex, sleep, stress. Um, and there's reason. This study came out in 2020. Um, so here is the endocannabinoid system. You see ECS right here. What's this? Um, this is HPA. It is our hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. What's that? You don't have to remember that. Just remember HPA. Um, the HPA controls a lot of our hormones, um, many of our neurotransmitters. So it's connected to our circadian rhythm, our stress response, visceral sensations, bowel motility, inflammation. Um, this connection here is why cannabis can work on so many different processes in our body and chemical reactions and, and hormones and neurotransmitters. Um, I'm going to deep dive into more neurotransmitters later, but um, it has a lot to do with a lot of our basic functions. And it kind of, this study maps out where other medicines kind of fall. So you have... Um, COX inhibitors decrease inflammation if you have arthritis, if you have chronic pain. This is how that works right here, but you see the ECS kind of ties back to all of it. Um, I mentioned cannabinoids and terpenes. So if you think back to comparing cannabis to citrus fruit, um, within the orange, um, think of that as our THC cannabis. But if you divided that up, 
you took like an orange from that group. Well, if you took a cannabis plant or a hemp plant, there's 140 different cannabinoids within that plant. Um, they all do very different things. And this is a slide I absolutely love to share. Um, so most folks have heard of THC and CBD. Well, there's 138 more and they all do something different. And there's still so many studies pending. Some of these studies are old, but I like to include them just to show how very different things are. So we have THCA. THCA is the precursor to THC, um, not psychoactive, helps with PTSD, sleep disorders, appetite stimulation, um, pain, so many different things. You have THCV, which is being studied now to look into insulin resistance. Can it help diabetic patients? It actually has been researched to show that people can lose weight using THCV. Um, you have CBG, which is being looked at for various um, psychiatric disorders as well as neurological disorders. Um, it's also been in a couple of oncology studies. You have CBDA, which is another really useful useful cannabinoid. CBDA is the precursor to CBD, helps you metabolize CBD, um, also is a great anti-inflammatory, great for anxiety, great for sleep. Um, so I can go on and on and on and on and on, um, but there are various cannabinoids and they are just your thousand different strains of cannabis are various concoctions of mixing and matching these cannabinoids. Terpenes, which I don't have a slide on, are another really wonderful thing in cannabis. Terpenes um, actually exist in many, many plants and are used in making pharmaceuticals as well. So terpenes are the essential oil of cannabis. Um, it's the smell from citrus fruit. It's the smell of lavender. Uh, cannabis has those as well, and they also have been studied for various therapeutic effects. Uh, next, sorry, my slides are there, clunky. Um, so sometimes when I work with a patient, part of my job when I recommend products um, is I'm trying to make an entourage effect happen. An entourage effect is really important when working with cannabis, trying to get it to do something therapeutically and not recreationally. So if you were to use a cannabis brownie recreationally, what happens is that THC that's isolated binds directly into CB1. When it binds directly into CB1, you feel really good. Um, you get that euphoria as a side effect. Euphoria is one of the main um, side effects of cannabis, and it only is can uh, THC. THC is the only psychoactive compound in cannabis, um, and it's what brings us that psychoactive euphoria. And I encourage patients and clients, when this happens, embrace the euphoria. That's a great side effect. Um, but a also, when it binds this well, comes with some uncomfortable side effects, anxiety, increased heart rate. Some people feel their bodies a lot more. So what we try to do when using cannabis therapeutically is we add in things like CBD, CBG. What happens then is really cool. The CBD will try to sneak up on that receptor and it block, it doesn't bind with it, but it blocks THC from combining completely. We do this with other cannabinoids. Um, we mix and match. Our body and the cannabis loves when we mix and match. And it makes for an increased therapeutic effect with a decreased uncomfortable side effect. So when you use the entourage effect to your advantage, you increase euphoria, you increase pain relief, you increase the therapeutic effect that you're looking to get, and you decrease the chance of an uncomfortable side effect. Um, that matters. Um, so if you take a look, the, this is a chart regarding cannabis CBD compared to synthetic cannabinoids. So Marinol is something that's commonly prescribed to oncology patients and pancreatic cancer patients. Um, Marinol is expensive. It's $3,000 for 60 pills. It binds really well to that CB1 receptor. So there are more side effects. Um, there is a documented death from Marinol because it's synthetic. Plant cannabis can't kill you because um, there are no receptors for that. Marinol is a little, and synthetic cannabis has a little different chemical formula to it. So there has been one or two reported deaths from Marinol. Um, Sizamet is another one, um, $10,000 for 120 pills. Um, so plant cannabis, more affordable, cannot kill you. There's no lethal dose. The lethal dose in a lab is 24,000 joints in a 24 hour period. It's impossible. Um, affordable, accessible, and better for you.
So um, when I speak to doctors and even when I get somebody who's very hesitant about cannabis because of kind of this really bad stigma and PR that's happened since 1937, um, I pause to kind of talk about evidence-based practice. So I, um, I love science. I've been a registered nurse for ah, 13 years now. Um, evidence-based practice is important, but there's a flaw in evidence-based practice. Uh, I get a lot of push that we don't have enough research for cannabis. And I've spoken to cannabis physicians um, who disagree with that assertion. Uh, I'm with them. Um, there is ample cannabis research to show that we should be using this therapeutically for symptom control. We obviously need more, but we know that it's safe. That's what we know. Um, the other problem with evidence-based practice is evidence-based practice hasn't always benefited all people. Most evidence-based practice is based on randomized control trials. That's the gold standard of pharmaceutical testing. Randomized control trials up until the early 2000s were mostly done on men, white men of European origin between the ages of 25 and 65. That leaves out women, uh, BIPOC communities, indigenous communities, um, non-binary folks. So much, so many people are left out. And we see the cascade of effects of this. We saw it in the 90s where women were dying from heart, uh, heart disease more than men. And people said, why? And it's because they didn't study women. Our symptoms are very different than men. Um, we see this in antihypertensive agents. Um, there are some communities where antihypertensive agents, some of them just don't work. Um, so cannabis is now moving into a better direction of accounting for different people of different genders, of different races. Um, so we weren't using evidence-based practice for everyone in the first place is my first argument. Second argument is we have enough research to know that this is safe. Um, we just need more. Uh, the third thing is there are studies that do show a negative side effect to cannabis. Um, however, studies prior to 2015, mostly self-reported, mostly from the underground market of cannabis. Um, we're going to talk about why that matters, but um, we weren't getting accurate information. Um, cannabis is a really porous plant. So is hemp. If you plant it in the ground, it's something called a bioremediator. That means it sucks up everything in the soil. That's good because it sucks up nutrients. I know a lot of folks use um, oncology patients that make, they grow their own cannabis and they make a smoothie out of the stock and the leaves and whatever they don't use to make their medicine. Um, the problem with it being a bioremediator is it also sucks up heavy metals fungus, bacteria, pesticides. Um, when these studies were done and self-reported, we didn't know what was mixed in people's cannabis. We didn't know the growing conditions. They were mostly grown indoors, which we now know increases heavy metals and increases pesticides that people were ingesting. So we don't actually know if cannabis was causing side effects or if it was something else. Um, so that's just a note on research. So we know that this is safe. We still need studies on long-term effects, but overall, um, the research has been flawed for a long time and cannabis moves in a much better direction. Why have a cannabis nurse? Why does my field exist? Um, why would someone hire me? You could just go to the dispensary, right? Well, not really. Um, there's no standardized dosing in cannabis. So um, if I have a 35-year-old female um, with high blood pressure and chronic pain from arthritis, and I have another 35-year-old female with chronic pain from arthritis, same height and weight, they're going to have a totally different regimen. Um, I do an assessment to kind of see their metabolism. Do they hypermetabolize medications? Have they hypermetabolized pain medications in the past? Um, what's their diet like? What's their exercise like? What's their personality like? Um, we don't truly know what makes people require a different dose. That's where a lot more research is needed, but we just know that there's no standardized dosing. A lot of things in medicine have standardized dosing cannabis, no. So the dosing range is very wide. CBD can be dosed from five milligrams to 1500 daily, THC from 0.18 to 100. That's a lot of room. And cannabis is unique because it's biphasic. What's biphasic mean? Never works the same way on the same person twice. So um, what I do, what most of my work is, is guiding clients and patients towards this medium dose. So if somebody goes to the dispensary and just ask for something to help with pain, what could happen is they get something um, and that dose is too high. They feel uncomfortable, therapeutic benefits are diminished. 
Sometimes they're very timid. They're very afraid. Cannabis is new to them. They use it and they feel no relief. They don't feel anything and they think it's broken. <laughs> and then they don't want to use cannabis again. When anyone hits a dose that's too low or too high, um, if they don't aren't aware that cannabis is biphasic, they may never want to use it again. So with my guidance, I try to get people to this medium dose. It is not easy. Um, oftentimes my clients and patients take about three to 10 sessions with coaching um, to get to the right place in their regimen where they have to be to control their symptoms. Um, very rarely, somebody will have one appointment and it'll work. Um, there's a little bit of science there and a lot more luck. Usually about three appointments is where I see people finally starting to get where they need to be adverse side effects. Um, pretty benign overall. So adverse side effects, um, dry mouth, uh, dehydration, then you get dizziness, food cravings, which for some folks, especially in the oncology population, food cravings is not a bad thing. Um, increased somatic sensation, so you feel your body more. A uh, big one is drug interactions with pharmaceuticals, and we're going to talk about that. Um, so what cannabis does and what's cool about it is imagine your blood vessel. So this is your veins, your arteries. So they look like this. Cannabis is a vasodilator. What a vasodilator is, is it opens up your vascular uh, structures. What that means, um, that lowers your blood pressure, that relaxes you. That's why you feel your body more. There's some insensible fluid loss going on. Um, this is where people due to vasodilation also find um, more pleasurable sexual relations because of vasodilation. Vasodilation um, is a mechanism that happens when people use Viagra, um, nitrates, vasodilation is how it works. Cannabis does the same thing. So when you use cannabis, just be sure to drink water. That's why you get dizzy and dry mouth is from that insensible fluid loss and vasodilation. Um, there are more uncomfortable side effects. If you used a really high inappropriate dose, you could pass out. Your basic vital signs could get a little crazy. Um, anxiety, you can get pretty intense anxiety. If you use a really high dose over 100 milligrams, you can get hallucinations. Um, these dose dependent ones are very rare and only with very irresponsible recreational use. So I talked about drug drug interactions. Um, most people think cannabis is a natural plant. It's a supplement I can get at a gas station. Don't get it at a gas station. Um, I can get it anywhere. CBD is everywhere. It interacts with all of these drugs, all of them. And it interacts in a different way with everyone. Sometimes it increases your drug level. Sometimes it decreases your drug level. This is why utilizing a cannabis clinician, a nurse, a doctor is super important. But also, if you choose not to do that, if you're using CBD or cannabis, you have to talk to your doctor. The other thing that I get hired for more often than not, sometimes people are like, I will pay you for one session. I don't need to talk to you. Can you just call my doctor and tell him I'm using cannabis? Um, it's something I do often and I don't mind because it's important for your physician to know. Um, there are, most of these drug-drug interactions are fairly benign. There are cases where they may not be. Um, much of this interaction is mostly dose dependent, but the reason why we watch it more than other drugs, um, right now, if you're on pharmaceuticals, there's probably two or three reactions already happening. But that's fine because we know what to anticipate. We know what dose they happen at. We know what happens. Um, we know how often they happen. You know, there's an interaction, but it could be one in 5,000. In particular to cannabis, we don't know those things yet. So we have to just keep a watchful eye. I tell my patients about what their drug interactions could be. I communicate it to their doctor. Um, and we watch a lot of times and I educate on how to watch, what to watch for. Um, some big ones is cannabis interacts with um, Coumadin. So that's a blood thinner. Um, so you want your doctor to know about that, to be following that. The other big thing is Plavix. Um, if you've had a heart attack within the last year, you may be on Plavix. CBD interacts with Plavix. It decreases the amount in your bloodstream. We don't want that um, because it could clog up your heart. So those are two medications that you definitely need to talk to your doctor um, or a nurse before utilizing cannabis. Um, and this is part of my work is double checking for this and communicating with the physician that this exists and that we need to monitor closely. Um, treatments of overuse. So um, while cannabis is very great as a substance for controlling symptoms. 
Um, sometimes people feel like they've used too much. Don't worry. There are things you can do. Uh, hydration helps a lot. If you're not too dizzy, a hot shower helps. Other things, um, taking CBD because of the entourage effect, it'll block up that receptor and kind of have more of a calming effect and take away a lot of the uncomfortable side effects. But other things are lemon rind and peppercorns. If you take those and you just chomp on them, that helps kind of dampen down your high as well. Um, I will say nothing will reverse a THC high. You just got to wait it out. Um, however, um, usually there's no reason if your only trouble is you've used too much THC, you typically don't have to go to an emergency room for it. The only thing they do in the emergency room is IV fluids and held all. Um, most people do not require those things. They just essentially need to let time pass. Um, I always tell folks who hire me that if you feel things like shortness of breath, chest pain, weakness on one side of your body, those are not from cannabis. They're still medical emergencies and to definitely call your doctor. Um, things like heart rate increasing, could be cannabis, but I always tell people, you know, if it doesn't come back down with lying down or rest, if you have an elevated heart rate that stays that way for over 30 minutes to 45 minutes, if it's a regular, that's still a medical problem and you still need to call your doctor. Um, very rare that um, somebody's heart rate will elevate and it will be something beyond the cannabis, but we want to be safe. So we always call our doctor if we see something unusual. Therapeutic uses. So currently um, this slide has been improved upon. This is from 2019, not that long ago, but now there's about 20 to 30 confirmed therapeutic uses of cannabis. Um, this is from Mayo Clinic. Some of the earliest work on cannabis was actually patient driven. So the reason why we have cannabis laws the way we do today, we need to thank patients of the 80s and 90s and 70s for making this happen. Um, it was HIV patients and oncology patients in the beginning controlling symptoms and trying to get appetite stimulation. And it worked. Um, and thanks to them, that's why we got can medical cannabis laws. And that's how we started getting basic research. And that's how we're getting global research. Um, it also helps with MS. Um, anti-emetic effect, um, seizure disorders, glaucoma, some new studies emerging on dementia, PTSD, um, things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, arthritis, chronic pain, neurologic pain, migraines, ALS. Um, I could go on and on and on and on. Um, sexual dysfunction, menopause symptoms. There's some new emerging studies regarding that. Endometriosis. Um, like I said, I could, I could literally talk about this for hours, but I'm going to continue on. So, um, and it's growing um, and it's so amazing to watch the science emerge. So this is one of my very favorite studies. Um, what happened was these researchers um, said, hey, physician, tell your, tell your patients to use cannabis. We want to see what happens to their pharmaceutical meds. And they did. They watched these folks for a year. Uh, folks decreased how much pain medication they were refilling by 1800s. But you also see anxiety, depression, nausea, um, really everything. You, people just stopped refilling medication. Um, their doctor was able to wean them off of it. And they just got to use cannabis. And it worked. Um, so this study is important to me because this shows me lives saved and quality of life's increase. Uh, 1800 Pain medication refills, not refilled, means less people with bowel obstructions, less people with respiratory distress, less people with opioid addiction. Um, those are huge. Somewhere in that 1800, lives were saved. We don't know how many, um, but pretty amazing studies also coming out about cannabis being used as a tool to actually the opposite of what we were told. If you're from the D.A.R.E. generation like me, we were told that cannabis is a gateway drug. Turns out it's a gateway drug away from the other stuff. So cannabis is now being researched to be used to get people off opioid addiction, um, to stop them from using other kinds of substances like alcohol and cocaine too. So cannabis can be a useful tool as well. Um, consideration benefits. So I, when I do lunch and learns with physicians or even in this context where somebody may randomly kind of come across it and watch it. Um, cannabis nurses and what we talk about at our conferences is doctors and providers need to start being more comfortable as cannabis as a first line um, for symptom control and not a last line. We know so far that it's safer than things like ibuprofen. Ibuprofen has a side effect of GI bleeding. So you could have your, you know, a belly bleed, which you don't want. Um, it also harms your kidneys. Um, cannabis doesn't do that. Um, 
There's no lethal dose, which is great. You don't have to worry about an accidental overdose. Um, decreased utilization of opioids, ben benzodiazepines, and other medications. Um, folks with chronic pain, they increase lucidity. Um, that case study we talked about, um, she is not the only patient I have had like that. Um, lots of folks who are on, um, or somebody listening, you know this, if you're on a lot of morphine, hydrocodone, oxycontin, it's hard. You're, out, you're not in pain, but you're sleeping. Um, folks want to enjoy their family. They want to enjoy their life. Um, they don't want to be bed bound. You know, they don't want to be in pain either. And so cannabis is a really great bridge for that. Overall reports of improved quality of life. Um, I do encourage folks to step in that euphoria. I sometimes partner with art therapists. Um, use cannabis while doing things you enjoy. Use cannabis at a fancy dinner if you um, have chronic pain. It'll taste amazing. Use cannabis while painting. Use cannabis while you're playing the piano. Use cannabis while writing. Turn on your favorite movie. These things can become really enjoyable. Um, I have, you know, various age of mothers and parents who do use cannabis as a medicine for their chronic pain. Um, when I'm doing education with them, I encourage them, you know, um, as long as there's another grown up around um, and, you know, you're not altered, you know, play with your kids. Um, having cannabis take away that kind of running to-do list mothers have while controlling pain is really great and engaging, you know, to play Legos and not have to worry about that going through your brain. Um, for patients who are, have an oncology diagnosis or palliative pancreatic uh, cancer patients, what's great is it gives back autonomy to the patient. So um, no one is around prescribing cannabis. Um, what cannabis nurses do is we tell you how to apply the research to you. So I recommend products that you could try that may work for you, but I don't choose them. You choose them, the patient, um, and that's really freeing. So if you don't like something, if you're like, I am not vaporizing, I don't want a lotion, you just go down the list and you choose what you want. That's really empowering um, to give that control back. In traditional medicine with pain medicine, we don't do that in the hospital, nor is it done in the clinic. Usually it's this very hierarchical relationship where it's take this, take this medicine, I don't want to, okay. And that's kind of the end of it. Cannabis, there's a lot more room to tailor this to your life and your lifestyle and your goals. Um, other studies are starting to emerge showing the opposite of what we heard about cannabis before. So cannabis users lower blood pressure. They lower their BMI. Um, there's a huge study where every cannabis user came out with a lower BMI. Decreased blood pressure. I've seen this one in my work and in the field too. Um, clients, patients, they go to see their PCP after they've used cannabis for pain control. Um, they were hypertensive before and then they get weaned off their hypertensive meds because all of a sudden they don't need them anymore. Um, enhanced sleep, better sexual health, better appetite, um, less anxiety. So there's just so many benefits. Um, here are some studies to prove what I'm saying. So in this top study was a study done, uh, three studies compiled regarding nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy. They gave the patients plant-based cannabis. They also gave them the synthetic cannabis and then a placebo. Um, cannabis performed great. Also down here, chronic pain, neuropathic and cancer pain, same, many studies compiled. Um, cannabis performs better than placebo in every one of these studies except for one study. Um, so we know it works. This is plenty of data um, and it's growing. I kind of talked about how it elevates your mood, euphoria is a side effect. Um, I also had a note about how it helps, especially if you're on hospice, if you're on palliative care, if you're um, receiving end of life services. Um, cannabis is a great tool because it kind of helps us deal with our existential dread overall. Um, and that's because of how it acts on our brain. So earlier in the talk, I talked about how it reacts with various neuroreceptors. So um, cannabis kind of mimics, particularly CBD, what um, our Zoloft's and our Lexapro's do. Um, it increases serotonin. Serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters that gives us happiness and pleasure takes away anxiety. Cannabis acts on serotonin, dopamine, and GABA receptors. Those three receptors are just part of the puzzle of what makes us pleasant, what makes us happy, what takes away worry, what takes away stress. Um, and we have real science that's starting to show that there's a real chemical change happening. 
lots of other therapeutic uses, some cool new studies that came out and are very relevant is with COVID, um, the entire world shut down and all the research was dedicated to that, rightfully so. However, um, many scientists and doctors in Israel knew Israel is the birthplace of CBD, um, found out that CBD is an anti-inflammatory COVID seems like an inflammatory disease where we get a cytokine storm and we see a lot of inflammatory processes happening. So they thought, let's just see what happens when we toss CBD. There were about nine to 12 studies, some still ongoing, um, but just in the animal studies went really well. So when mice get COVID or when mice get respiratory distress, they die 100%. When these mice in the study were given CBD, there was a 100% survival rate. So they did not experience the cytokine storm. Um, that was a really great study and a building block to go off of. There were other studies that showed CBD um, patients with COVID um, were less likely to go into respiratory distress and were less likely to be intubated and have a poor outcome. So um, CBD, well, if you are not vaccinated, you get COVID-19, um, certainly you still have to go through all the protocols, but using it as a supplement likely cannot hurt. Of course, talk to your doctor and check for drug interactions. But we have some really cool studies coming. Also the kind of fable that cannabis and smoking cannabis can cause lung cancer, not really. Um, anytime we put anything in our lungs for long-term, that includes pollution, poor air quality. Of course, there's always a risk of disease in our lungs. However, when they tested for cancer versus cigarettes, there was no increased chance of cancer with cannabis cigarettes. And they actually noticed that folks who smoked cannabis had an increased um, vital lung capacity, which is actually an improvement in their lungs um, within seven years of chronic use. After seven to 10 years of daily chronic use of cannabis, you do start seeing decreased lung function but that's obviously not what anyone thought or what we've ever been told. Um, so how, how do you schedule an appointment with a cannabis clinician? So um, there's about 20 of us over the country. I would say probably maybe up to 50, but we're new. So me personally, um, unfortunately, um, my services are self-pay and not covered by insurance. Um, why um, schedule one restrictions in Canada, um, those nurses actually are covered by insurance. There's three cannabis nurses in Canada that I know of, and they charge much less than I do. And it's because they're reimbursed by insurance. Um, a single session starts at $75. Um, most patients, like I said, find that right dose in three to 10 appointments. I am working on, I'm a nurse first. I consider myself a social enterprise and not a business um, because I, want to help people. I want to grow a science. That's what drives me. So I'm trying to currently figure out a way to let everyone use these services. So a monthly medical cannabis subscription program is coming soon where questions can be answered at a very affordable rate. Um, three appointments is where most people gravitate to. Um, you get a nursing care plan to follow up questions and three appointments where I do an in-depth assessment, you get the care plan, um, and then you get education and then I coach you through how to titrate um, and how to find your right dose. And then the gold package is $500, unlimited question, a cannabis journal, everything from the green package, but more appointments. Um, so how do you use cannabis? So this is something that I teach my clients and patients, um, but administration and route matters. Um, so if you are smoking or vaping, this could be a really good tool for somebody with pancreatic cancer. Why? Um, the reason is, is because if you're already nauseous and vomiting, you don't necessarily want to eat an edible. So vaping could be a really useful tool. It hits you fast, seconds to minutes, and lasts for about two to three hours. So you're not committed. Um, if you are about to eat lunch, you could take a puff of smoking or vaping. Um, and then within a couple of minutes, you will likely be hungry. Um, and then by the time your meal is done, you will be on the downslope um, coming down from euphoria. Your appetite will be lessening very quick. Topicals, benefit of topicals, usually not systemically absorbed. Some of them last for up to 12 hours. They work fast. Patches are systemic, most of them. That duration is also 12 hours. Discreet is great. Um, also, if you don't like how you feel, you could take the patch off and then you feel better pretty quickly. 
Sublinguals are another great option for folks who are perhaps nauseous or vomiting. Sublinguals will go under your tongue. You hold for 90 seconds. Um, they last about six to eight hours um, and they skip over the liver. They skip over first pass metabolism at that first pass. Um, and it lasts for about six to eight hours. This is another really good choice for um, somebody with pancreatic cancer, um, especially if they're, they have a G-tube, um, if they have a J-tube, if they're having trouble keeping down solids, this is a good way to stimulate appetite without agitating your GI system. Also a note about CBD right here. Um, CBD is not the magic potion that the industry kind of pushes it out to be. It is magical, but it doesn't work right away. That's kind of the caveat. CBD, think of it like a vitamin D. It takes about 14 to 30 days of continued use for it to work. Um, I see a lot of marketing and advertising saying like, take the CBD, you're gonna feel better soon. That only happens for a very small subset of people and at a very specific dose. Most folks will not feel the benefit of CBD for about 14 to 30 days. But I will say after that threshold of 14 to 30 days, people have really, really fantastic outcomes. Um, and then edibles. So edibles are really popular. They're cute. They're fun. They're gummies. They taste good. What's not to like? Easy, discreet. Um, so edibles have some caveats to them. Uh, onset is within one to two hours. So you have to be patient. You have to time it right. Um, it is absorbed through the gut and the liver, which means if you eat a really fatty meal, that's going to alter how much cannabis you're absorbing. Cannabis is fat, um, fat metabolized. So lipophilic is how we say it in the scientific community. Um, so how you feel may change depending on what you eat. The duration is also another issue. Minimum is six hours, maximum is 12 hours. And then if you are an older adult over 65, if you have any issues with your liver or kidneys, um, there are case studies where people have been altered for up to 24 hours. So um, edibles can be a really great tool, but you just have to um, have some guidance and know and, and, and anticipate. Also, um, Sometimes edibles have more of a euphoric and psychoactive effect, and that's because the THC that exists in sublinguals in anything you smoke or vaporize is different. Smokable and vaporized cannabis includes THC delta-9. The chemical component of edibles is THC delta-11. Um, so very different, um, but edibles can be a really great tool, but they stick around. So that could be uncomfortable for folks. So safety considerations. So I've got you, you're like, yes, I'm going to try cannabis and I'm going to talk to my doctor about it. What do you do next? So only purchase products from reputable companies. 90%, this was in the Journal of American Medicine, 90% of CBD is fraudulent. You want to look for lab testing. I look for lab testing. I want to see six pages of lab testing. Otherwise I cannot recommend it to a client. Um, I want to be sure my clients are getting real products. I also want to be sure how we talked about heavy metals, that they're not ingesting lead, fungus. The last thing I want for somebody who's immunocompromised and on chemotherapy is for them to ingest a huge, um, a huge tincture of fungus or bacteria or a pesticide. So checking for third-party lab results is really important. Um, other safety considerations, if you're trying THC for the first time, no matter what dose, give yourself 12 hours without obligations. If it's an edible, give yourself about six to eight hours if you're smoking or utilizing a sublingual. Do not drive during this period of time. Do not operate heavy machinery. Um, I usually recommend trying cannabis on a day where, you know, if you're a parent, somebody else is home. Um, if you are a caregiver, same, same, somebody else is with you. If you have any important tasks, probably not the time to schedule them. Um, you may be aware of somatic sensations, so you're going to feel your body more. You might get a little anxious, and that's okay. Use those kind of safety mechanisms I brought up to kind of decrease that. But if you're working with a cannabis clinician, um, shouldn't happen. And if you are not, if you want to Go at it by yourself. Always start low and go slow. Um, I know some of the gummies at 10 milligrams may seem enticing, but for most people, that is way too high of a starting dose for somebody. Stay hydrated. Staying hydrated will make you feel a lot better, will decrease some of those uncomfortable sensations that could possibly happen. Uh, the other note I want to add is try not to drink alcohol, especially when you're first trying these things. Um, alcohol and cannabis sometimes don't go so well together because of that dehydration 
vomiting factor. Um, and if you have more than two drinks, you're at an increased risk of vomiting. So try to avoid it. And then always check for legitimate products. Every dispensary in Illinois and most states um, have to have COAs on hand. That's where you could ask them for that lab testing and extraction methods to see what you're consuming. So um, for healthcare providers, what do you tell your doctor? What should they look for? If you are a physician or a nurse practitioner, what should you look for? So labs, labs are important. So that's why I always encourage my patients to follow somebody who is cannabis supportive and who will be with them for long-term. This could be a specialist. This could be your primary care doctor. If you do not have anyone in your care team that is supportive, I really recommend you find a functional medicine doctor, an integrative medicine doctor who will be supportive of this. So I would like for doctors to follow liver enzymes. CBD, because it's metabolized in the liver, um, can increase liver enzymes. So, um, so far from what I've read, not related to any clinical diagnostic disease process. Um, but if you have liver metastasis, if you have pancreatic cancer, you don't want your liver enzymes elevated anymore. Um, so usually when we see a bump, what happens is I recommend that the patients start decreasing whatever they're doing with CBD to kind of decrease that liver enzyme uh, increase. So um, platelets are important. So one way you could also consume cannabis is through rectal or vaginal suppositories. Um, for folks with any kind of GI related cancer, a rectal suppository can be a really great tool if you have pain um, in that region of your body. Also for any kind of gynecological cancer, rectal or vaginal um, suppositories can be a really useful tool. The only thing is you definitely need labs checked. Um, you need to know that your platelets are are at a great number um, and that you don't have a low white count. Um, so you have to be careful before using rectal or vaginal suppositories. And that's another conversation that has to be had with some sort of um, cannabis or healthcare provider. Um, you need someone to check for drug interactions. There's a very large list. More drugs than not do have drug interactions with cannabis. Uh, most can be dealt with, but you just want to know that you're not on something that could have a really bad side effect if you use cannabis with it. If you're having surgery or anesthesia, um, cannabis is known in studies to alter sedation. So please tell your surgeon, tell your anesthesiologist, tell your nurse. Um, if you have been taking cannabis to control symptoms or recreationally, you want to hold any cannabis products 48 hours prior to your procedure and you still need to let them know. Um, what happens if you don't let them know is they won't use enough sedation to put you under and people have cannabis users have woken up during surgery that could be avoided if you just let them know um, a lot of this kind of stems from the stigma um, the old stigma that we all have to push hard against um, but please have conversations with your providers um, so you can be safe and have great outcomes. Um, and then something that you could tell your doctor, I can tell your doctor, and I, I shout from the rooftops is um, recommending cannabis is an early intervention um, and an early option can benefit patients. Um, with how much we know about how little side effects and how overall safe it is, especially CBD. CBD kind of knocks it out of the parks in, in terms of safety. Um, as it should be an early intervention due to decreased side effects. Um, I have seen, and this needs to be studied more, but I have been doing this work for two years, but I was an ICU nurse beforehand that mostly worked with oncology patients. And I will say that the patients that are started on a cannabis regimen earlier, either by their physician or by their family members or by their own, you know, gumption to just go and, and try it because they read that this could be a useful tool. Um, they do seem to do better um, for much longer. When this is tried as a last resort, um, sometimes it just, it, it doesn't work as well when it's a last resort. So um, encourage your physician to, I will teach them, have them read just to let them, let you start early or let your family members start early. So what happened to this particular person? Um, so remember, she was very sick when I met her. Her quality of life was very poor. She had to stop her treatment because she could not tolerate it. And she was just getting dressed, getting out of bed to get back in bed. So I worked with her for three months. Um, what happened? She was able to go back to starting her immunotherapy. Um, she now exercises daily. She is spending time with her children. Um, she's on a new chemo where we were really worried because um, the side effects of 
in her like very intense GI upset and she's doing phenomenal. So she's back on chemotherapy. She's back on immunotherapy. She was able to decrease some of her medications. She was able to, now she doesn't need compazine. She doesn't need Zofran. She gained weight. Um, I think she also, she decreased some of her opioids as well. Um, but of course, if you're trying cannabis for the first time, do not stop any medications yourself. Definitely talk to your doctor and they can decrease it um, because we want to be safe. Um, but she did fantastic. So this is what a care plan looks like. Um, these were her goals, less nausea, increased appetite, less pain, more time with her family and uninterrupted sleep from pain. Um, and this is what it looks like. So nurses, we practice in a very unique way. Um, we have nursing diagnoses, we set goals, and then we, we say the rationale. So I pulled out an old tool from nursing school um, to be able to provide cannabis education. So the nursing interventions, again, I just recommend things that could be a useful tool for people. Um, it is not a prescription. Nobody is forced to do anything and the patient chooses. And this is just guidelines. So um, I give them just a starting place of what they sh could possibly start at that will minimize anything uncomfortable and maximize therapeutic um, results. And so this is what it looks like. And um, she did great. So she's gained over 10 pounds. Um, just doing really fantastic. Um, she, I use this case study because she gave me permission, uh, but I do have many other patients who've had a very same clinical course, like doing very poorly. Um, this story gets told of many age groups. Um, this was her story. Um, she's around my age, she's in her forties. Um, however, I've had this happen with 90 year olds with various oncology diagnosis and we work with their PCP and we work with their oncologist and we see really, really positive results. Um, so this is me. So if you're interested, um, in using cannabis, I recommend me, um, of course, but there are many other, every cannabis nurse out there is really qualified and really passionate and knows their craft. Um, so, you know, they exist besides me, there's about 19 others, but this is me. I'm happy to teach your doctor, um, at any time and I am ready. I'm sure there's questions, so I am ready for them. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was incredible. And you're right. There are a ton of questions. So let's get started. Can you walk us through a session with you? What, is, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, most of the time. So um, the three sessions, first session, I like to meet somebody. Um, so I do that in-depth assessment. Um, the thing that we're all taught to do in nursing school and medical school, that, that long history and physical, um, I provide that more of a history. Um, I will do a physical if they for the person comes to my office or if I go to their home, um, I take their vitals. I do nursing things. I listen to their lungs and heart, um, but I do an in-depth assessment. What's your past medical history? What drugs are you taking? What supplements are you taking? How have you reacted before to alternative you know, therapies? Have you done acupuncture? What do you exercise? What's your diet like? I ask a whole bucket of questions. And then I ask how, you, tell me about your life. What are your hobbies? Um, getting to know a person is really important because um, in nursing school, it stuck with me that we're treating a whole person. We're just not treating like a walking symptom. Um, so that's important. And it's important in cannabis because there's such a variation of dosing that I wanna know what somebody's like. Then I ask cannabis questions. If somebody's tried cannabis before, I ask them to detail. Uh, what is a great association you have with cannabis? What's a negative association you have with cannabis? What happened when you used cannabis before? How did that feel? Um, the other thing I ask is, do you have a negative association with cannabis? And the reason why I do that is sometimes stigma can block um, a good outcome. So a lot of times I encourage, you know, like, let's talk about it. Like, let's unpack it. Let's go through the history. Second appointment is a lot of education that you all had today, um, but more honed in on what that particular client needs. And then we go through their care plan and I educate. Um, I take what I say in the rationale and I just explain, you know, um, I recommend a topical for you, um, Susie with our arthritis because we have CB1 receptors in our skin and a topical might really work for you and you are a vice president of a bank uh, and you can't be altered. So topical's great. So I go through that with you. And then that's where the patient tells me like, oh, I see that you said maybe a gummy, but I don't really like sugar. I don't eat gluten. Um, is it okay? Can you, what else is like that? And then I'm like, okay, well, instead you could do this. So that's your second appointment. 
appointments after that. Um, I check in with folks, like, how is it going? What's working? What's not? And then they're like, well, I took half a gummy and I took it three times a day and I felt great. And then I upgraded it because I wanted to eat more and I took a whole gummy three times a day, but then I felt too dizzy. What do I do next? Um, and so then we talk about it. And I'm like, well, it, your dizziness could be from multiple things. Um, what happens when you went back to half a gummy? Did you still feel dizzy? And talking that through and they're like, well, no, when I took half the gummy, I didn't feel dizzy. Um, is there anything they should call their physician about? Because sometimes I'm kind of looking for, is there... Is there something that they need to call their doctor about? Um, sometimes it is a med reaction between cannabis and, and something else they're taking. And I'm like, have you talked to your doctor that you're taking cannabis? Um, and then they're like, oh, yeah, I know I didn't want you to talk to them. Let me talk to them. And then they say, hey, I'm using cannabis and now I'm dizzy. They take their blood pressure in the office and it turns out that the cannabis was lowering their blood pressure um, and they're still on, you know, a beta blocker or I'm trying to think of a beta blocker name now, Coreg. And so their doctor's like, ha, your blood pressure's low. Let's decrease your Coreg. Um, they come back to me and then problem solved. Um, so it's like a lot of troubleshooting going through it and essentially coaching folks on how to do this and how to do this and make it work for them. And those are more subsequent appointments. In between, I recommend a journal. Um, folks call me sometimes in between appointments if they forgot something to ask a question. Um, what do they do in a dispensary? They're like, oh, I forgot to ask you how I even go there. What happens? Um, that kind of thing. Right. So do you think now that it's becoming legal in more places that the stigma is going to go away? Or is there more education that's out there? I think with education, I think there lies the key um, in taking away the stigma. I will say that when I have went to physicians, um, the thing that got me in the door was being a critical care nurse. When I came at them with science and research, um, not kind of fluffy, you know, uh, stories, and those stories are all true, um, but when I gave them the hard science, they were like, okay, all right. And, and also, I do compare what I do now to critical care nursing. Um, in, in, in kind of cannabis nursing is a weird combination of wound nursing and critical care nursing. So in the ICU, um, we would have very sick people and the doctors would say, start them on life support. And they would order three drips and then they would walk away. And that was my job to titrate those drips up or down based on what that specific patient was doing. And there was no rhyme or reason as to why a patient was at five micrograms versus 10. It just was, you just had to watch and, ass and assess and reassess that patient. Very similar world of cannabis. The doctor's like, yeah, sure, try cannabis. I don't know how, <laughs> do it. Um, and it's my job to assess them and say, oh, maybe you should try one gummy or you know, maybe try one and teach them how to self titrate or teach them when to back off. So some of my rules are um, if you know, older adults, for example, um, move like a turtle. If you're using THC cannabis, go as slow as you can. Um, so education, sorry, I went around a long story, but yeah, education, 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 and then just breaking the stigma and, and telling that story of the history. And I include that history very specifically um, because when I was first learning about cannabis in nursing school, so I started this journey long ago. I wrote my last policy paper on it. Um, I got a lot of side eye from it, um, but I was like, wow, this plant can't hurt you. That's weird that it's illegal, huh? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So finally, when I deep dived into this 100%, you know, I heard racism was the root of, of cannabis and the prison industrial complex and the military industrial complex. And that all made sense. But then I always thought there must be something else. Like there's, there was a reason that this happened. And lo and behold, um, two guys wanted to make buckets of money and hemp stood in their way. Um, so getting that story out that it was not banned for scientific reasons, nothing happened to anyone. There wasn't some huge event. It wasn't like where we saw the opioid crisis. Remember, mm -hmm. Not that long ago, everyone and their uncle was getting prescribed opioids. You're in the ER and you have a cut, opioids, broke a leg, buckets of opioids. You have a cavity, ah, 30 Norcos, what could happen? Um, and then we saw the opioid crisis and we saw people dying and then we needed Narcan everywhere. Um, that was something that triggered folks to pull back on opioids. Nothing like that happened with cannabis. Never, ever, ever. So... So that it seems like that's the the change in terminology, you know, from marijuana pot, you know, into cannabis. It's it's now 
considered medical marijuana is really now medical cannabis, right? It's, there's this evolution that's happening. Yeah. And, and at the same time, it, it is all one in the same, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We, had, we had some questions coming in uh, about, that, about that front. Um, and it also speaks to why people would need a cannabis nurse, right? Uh, why can't I just do this on my own? Um, let's, let's use that and talk about the dispensaries. The fact that um, many dispensaries come across as though they have medical experts on their team um, and yet don't. Yes. So there is a health, I'm glad you asked this question. There's a health washing in the cannabis industry. Um, some dispensaries, not all, but some, um, most of those dispensaries do not have people, at least in the front, um, who are working and answering questions who have any scientific background. Um, there are a few out there. I, I could think of like 10 bud tenders off the top of my head and 10 managers who have very real degrees in sciences, but they are very few and far between. But there's a health washing. In some of the dispensaries, you'll notice that somebody might have the title of um, patient educator, uh, patient product health supervisor. I, I, I've seen just a lot of gobbledygook words. And I'm like, huh, what's the background? And it turns out it's just a label. Um, and people don't know where to get advice on cannabis. It, there's really no, you know, um, the federal restriction makes it hard for people like me to, you know, advertise in any way that I exist. Um, dispensaries have billboards and there's a stigma. So people aren't asking their friends, like, who do I go for advice? Um, you know, most businesses can thrive on word of mouth. Um, no one talks about their cannabis use or their chronic illness. I'm like at the center and intersection of like, uh, you know, protected health information that no one's sharing and that, ooh, and I'm using this like very like stigmatized substance and I'm not doing that. Um, so yeah, so the dispensaries um, sometimes will give either um, wrong advice um, or they just don't know what they don't know. Um, or they won't say anything. So this puts people in a bind. Um, but the word, what I would advise if there is a cannabis worker out there in the cannabis industry um, who is working on the retail side is you don't know something, just don't make it up. Because I have seen things made up that have harmed people. Um, like the Coumadin interaction, you know, can I take Coumadin and cannabis? Yes, but you have to monitor your INR. Um, you know, somebody erroneously got a 50 milligram gummy. I don't know how that happened. They had a huge fall and a huge bleed because they thought they were getting a basic starting dose and they ended up with something that was so, so inappropriate with them. Um, that's happened before a well-meaning grandchild will go to the dispensary and say like, and I've seen this, like, hey, my grandpa has cancer. Um, he can't sleep. What can I give him? And they will come out with a 100 milligram gummy and, you know, when I'm going over their products in person, I'll be like, oh my God, what is this? Don't take this. And I'll have to write like, do not use. <laughs> um, and the other thing is with drug interactions, um, folks go into the dispensary and they say, hey, I have, I have breast cancer, an example. People automatically assume from the media, ah, I heard cannabis can help breast cancer. And this is what bud tenders assume as well. And they're right. It could be a super useful, very helpful, very safe tool, but there are some chemotherapies that do interact a lot with um, breast cancer chemotherapy, like tamoxifen. So um, the, we still need more research on what dose that happens at, but um, cannabis nurses um, like me, we're taught in seminars that, you know, maybe some you know, folks with certain genetic markers and certain types of breast cancer maybe should be, you know, using lower amounts of THC. Um, and this is something that, you know, folks at the dispensary just don't know, and you could inadvertently be harming somebody um, because they don't know that this is interacting with their chemotherapy. So knowledge is power. Cannabis can be absolutely safe, but you just have to um, have a resource, essentially. Of course. Of course. So here's a specific question. They say, I'm fairly new to cannabis, but have purchased a small variety of products from low CBD THC to high THC, low CBD to try. The products that were suggested together give either no relief, the low THC, or helped quite a lot, the high THC. But my problem is being able to function when I have the relief I need with the higher THC, I feel defeated to have that relief that only lasts hours and I'm not able to do anything other than sleep. So um, they said, I would like to have a life. 
So <laughs> what, what do you, what do you recommend? <laughs> so I can't answer that because I have to get to know you more. I have to know what your diet is, uh, what your lifestyle is like, what other medications you're on, what your primary diagnosis is. Um, there are various tips and tricks, um, but I don't know if they'll work for you. Um, it could be a product issue. Um, sometimes it's an extraction issue. Other times um, it's just you need more of those other cannabinoids to um, decrease how psychoactive the THC is to provide pain relief. Um, one just kind of general advice that has helped a lot of my oncology clients um, tolerate high doses of THC, which is uh, oncology and HIV patients are where we see folks using a lot of THC. And that's because the more pain you're in, um, the, the more you could absorb THC. P people in a lot of pain do not feel as psychoactive effects um, as much. This needs to be studied as well. Um, but something that kind of works to help tolerate is CBD or CBDA. Taking that an hour before you use THC sometimes is enough to get people through the psychoactive because it, it dampens that but increases relief. But overall, to, to kind of guide you on that question, I would just, I would have to, I would have to, I would have to do an assessment. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Can you talk about potential interactions uh, between cannabis and chemo that our community should be aware of? We talked a little bit about it, but can we, can we talk a little bit more in depth? Yeah. Um, so cannabis with chemo and immunotherapy um, in radiation, super useful. So ways, let's talk about the ways that it can help. Um, it helps people tolerate chemotherapy by having them have less nausea, less, less overall bowel upset, less diarrhea, um, remain having an appetite, which keeps their weight up, keeps them active, keeps them pain-free, um, and has less side effects than your Zofran, your Compazine. You know, Zofran and Compazine are very useful tools. And sometimes what I coach patients on is, um, I understand that a goal is you want to get off pharmaceuticals is something I hear a lot. I don't, I hate taking 17,000 pills and I'm like, I know, but our primary goal is controlling your symptoms. And if that happens with cannabis and Zofran and Compazine, that's great. You know, not everyone is going to be able to wean off things. Um, and that's okay. Um, nobody gets a medal for weaning off pharmaceuticals. The goal is quality of life. Um, and I will say that some of those pharmaceuticals that we're using every day for chemotherapy and immunotherapy, your Zofran and your Compazine, um, they have side effects. Um, they do something, especially Zofran, uh, I'm going to get real sciencey here, but um, when we look at an EKG, it can do something called prolonging your QT. So our heart pumps by electricity. Prolonging a QT interval can be bad. It could cause a lot of problems. Zofran can do that. Oncology patients are usually in really high amounts. So when you use things like cannabis, where there's very little side effects, um, you could decrease some of those other nasty side effects from other things. Um, again, the goal typically is symptom control. Um, and cannabis is super useful in doing that without compiling on 17 pharmaceuticals in somebody's regimen that will give them side effects of not having quality of life sometimes. Um, as far as what to specifically know and what to look out for for cannabis and chemotherapy and immunotherapy is yes, there are some chemotherapies and immunotherapies that will interact with cannabis. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be using cannabis. It just means that you have to use it with guidance and have active participating conversations with your physician and with your palliative team. Um, I currently have a couple of clients and patients right now where they're using cannabis. Um, they're hospitalized a lot for dehydration and they really want to gain weight and they, they want to be active. Um, and their primary goal is to essentially get their appetite up. Um, and I'll see a, an interaction. And so what I do is I contact their doctor, their oncologist and their palliative doctor. And I'm like, hey, just so you know, this gal, this, this person, they, they have an interaction with their chemo. I, I let them know to look out for side effects. I'm letting you know, of course, like if you don't want them to use cannabis anymore, like I follow the physician's lead. I will never overstep a, a physician. Um, but um, I just want you to know, doctor, that Lexapro that you prescribed, you know, six months ago also has the same interaction 
uh, with the chemotherapy as well. So this is likely, uh, we should watch it, but it's probably okay. So you just need to have a conversation um, and just a constant communication. Um, the other thing, and, and when I talk to physicians and I do this is when we talk about, um, you know, can cannabis help? Um, I was saying this to Erin um, and everyone before we started that sometimes when I teach physicians about different interactions, I get like a deer in headlights look and I'm like, what's, what's wrong doctor? And they're like, no, I'm just thinking of all the times that chemotherapy failed and I just didn't ask if they were using CBD. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, we don't know, you know, probably no. Like there's a lot of reasons chemotherapy doesn't work or a certain drug class doesn't work. And those are things that are beyond anything I've ever learned in nursing school. I just know this from being in the ICU for a million years. Um, but I could tell that it's something that they think that maybe they should start asking and they should. Um, I got the same deer in headlights look when I did a, a grand rounds talk on Plavix um, where um, I saw a drug interaction with Plavix last August. It appeared in literature. It didn't like it was not popping up prior to last August. Um, and I started telling physicians about this and they would get the same look. They would say, oh gosh, I need to start asking people about this. And then another doctor that I wasn't in constant communication with was like, hey, look, cannabis causes heart attacks. People who've had heart attacks and then used cannabis had a second heart attack. And I was like, doctor, did you see this, this interaction with Plavix? And he's like, oh, that's why they might be having the second heart attack. And so we're learning as we go, but I will say, um, it, communication. The good news is people have been secretly using cannabis for mm, 75 years without telling anyone. Um, and we're not seeing, you know, massive amounts of mortality related to that. Granted, we don't have studies. Um, but can bad things happen when you're using cannabis in secret? It's not a never event. Um, it's just not often. But long story boring, always, always, always communicate with your physician, always. Um, Sounds like communication and education is, is really the key. Let's go into um, cannabis helping you get off of some medication. You, you've alluded to it, so yeah. is it possible? Yeah, so it is possible. Lots of research is still needed, but in the field, what I've seen, um, I've seen people come off things. So, um, I've had clients where they use cannabis for pain, for sleep, for sexual dysfunction, stress. Those are kind of the big four things that people come to me for. Um, and then I'll get a call from their doctor and they say, hey, thank you for taking care of that person. Their pain is better. Uh, does cannabis decrease blood pressure? And I'm like, it can. There were a couple studies, vasodilation, blah, 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 decreasing blood pressure. And they're like, yeah. Uh, this person was on like three antihypertensive agents and now they're on none. And it's just kind of weird because they've been on this for like 30 years. So, okay. Um, and then I'll get a call again and they're like, yeah, uh, just want to let you know that um, we should watch people's blood pressure. Cause I had another person who I sent to you for stress and now they're on nothing. And they were on this agent for like 20 years. Um, I've seen same thing, same call with diabetes. Somebody comes to me, they, um, they want to exercise more. Um, they have too much arthritis. Their inflammation is too bad. They can't, they haven't been mobile. They start using cannabis. They're exercising again. Not it's early. It's prior to exercise or some, I've had it both ways where the person started exercising more and the person just wasn't able to had another event happen in both cases. They were able to wean off their metformin. That's a type, diabetes type two medication. And there's a lot of thought around um, cannabis can be something that decreases insulin resistance. Um, so some agents that I've seen folks come off of kind of by surprise. Um, but now I'm starting to just warn people about it. But if you start using cannabis for pain or sleep or anything, you don't take yourself off anything. Call your doctor. Please call your doctor. Because I, I really, um, I'm always like, you might start feeling a lot better, especially if you're using this for anxiety or pain. But like, don't stop anything. <laughs> um, you need to talk to your doctor. Um, 
regarding opioids and benzodiazepines um, and things like trazodone, I have had many clients say, you know, my doctor thinks that I'm, you know, utilizing trazodone too much or I take Xanax too much. They don't want me to take any more opioids. I, I need to control my pain or my anxiety in a different way. Um, and with working with a very close relationship with their doctor, um, yeah, I've seen that too. I've seen people wean themselves from, mm, I don't know, 100 milligrams to tramadol to not even taking Tylenol. I've seen somebody taking, gosh, um, you know, 30, 30 of Norco multiple times a day come completely off of it. Um, and everyone has varying degrees of success because cannabis is so fussy and individual. Um, but people do have success. I, I always say I've been doing this now um, a year to two years. Um, and with cannabis, everyone feels better than they started. And then there's a range. I have some people who are like, ah, I feel a little better. And then I have people who are like, I'm pain-free for the first time in 20 years, and then everyone in the middle. So um, I never know where anyone's going to land, um, but I always am striving for that. Like, everything's great now. <laughs> so, and, and the more research that comes out, that's going to happen more. So. Great. Great. So I, I want to take a quick pause to, um, to say um, that we know that we're going over time. Um, questions are coming in fast and furious. So if anybody who is watching right now, if you need to cut out, if you need to, to go, um, don't worry. We're going to be sending out the recording um, after the session. It's going to still be, it's going to live on, on Facebook Live as well. And if you have questions that aren't um, answered or you think of questions afterwards, you could always send them to us. We'll get them to Rebecca and then we'll get back to you. So I wanted to put that caveat out there because um, I know that you know um, evenings are, are busy for many of our people in our community and we just wanna make sure that you know that we've got you covered, that we'll get you the, the content and the information afterwards. So thank you on that note. Um, going back to um, you know coming off of medications, let's take it to the extreme. Okay, yeah. this, is, this is kind of a two part question. So we had questions about, do you recommend synthetic, um, synthetic products? Um, do you recommend RSO? And then the further of um, that I've heard RSO can cure, or RSO oil can cure cancer. Can CBD, can cannabis, is it an end all be all that it can take it away? Yeah, so first I'll answer the synthetic cannabis question. Um, I would stay away from anything synthetic. Um, how I showed that example of THC binding really well, it seems like when THC super duper binds to those receptors, that's when in higher doses and synthetic formulas, that's when things go really haywire. If you remember, oh, I'm kind of aging myself here, but a couple decades ago, there was K2 and spice, uh, synthetic marijuana at the time was being sold in gas stations and people were dying and it's because it was synthetic cannabis. Um, we see the emergence of something called Delta 8. You might have walked past, it's everywhere. There are cafes putting Delta 8 in coffee. I went to a chocolate shop in Evanston, if you're in Illinois, um, where they're like, would you like a sample of my Delta 8? And I was like, really here in this chocolate shop? Um, without any warning, education, nothing. Um, we don't know anything about Delta 8. We know it's synthetic and then we kind of can conclude that synthetic cannabis is probably not the best for us. Um, we don't know anything about Delta 8. We've studied Delta 9. We've studied plant cannabis. We know what that can do. We have at least like the basics, right? Synthetic, THC 8, Delta 8, Delta 10. We don't know. Um, these compounds are found naturally in whole plant cannabis, which is fine. If you're using whole plant cannabis, that's whole plant cannabis is the gold standard. So if you find flower and you get all those cannabinoids and terpenes, that's perfect. Um, stay away from synthetics. If anybody is handing you a THC, Delta eight caffeine, something in a coffee shop, don't drink it. <laughs> um, you will get altered. Um, you shouldn't drive on it, but we don't even know the dosing, like how I could tell you, you know, in research, a starting dose of THC that alters somebody is probably around 2.5 milligrams to 10 milligrams. We don't know with Delta-8, it's 25, 50 milligrams. Like, 
we don't have any idea. So stay, stay away from synthetic cannabinoids, try to avoid it. Buy your cannabis from reputable growers and sellers that have labs. Don't buy it from a gas station. Maybe even a farmer's market might be a no unless they have their, they could like pull up their website and say like, no, look, look, look here. Um, is it, if a product is synthetic, uh, does it have to have it on the label? Does it have to say it? Is there um, regulations along those lines? So um, with something like Delta 8, Delta 10, the regulations get really hairy. Um, so if you've watched this entire talk, thank you. I could talk for years about cannabis. Um, the biggest barrier to kind of all these problems is the federal scheduling of cannabis. Being Schedule 1, uh, it can't be FDA approved. It um, We can't do research. Um, a lot of the research that we have is meta-analysis, which isn't great. Um, synthetic cannabis from pharmaceutical companies or globally is where I pull a lot of things from. Um, there is some research being done. We, the NIH actually does have cannabis. It's Rona, Mississippi. It has 13% THC. Um, it's poor quality. It's not the best. We need all of these problems will go away rather quickly with a quick rescheduling of cannabis. So write to your Congress people, <laughs> write to them now, write to your senators, um, or call the president because executive order could be flipped right away. Um, and then, so, so we talk about research, I'll segue to can cannabis cure cancer? You probably have all seen that. If you Google cannabis and cancer, it's gonna come up on the first page. Um, something called RSO gets a lot of buzz curing cancer. So no, at this point, cannabis cannot cure cancer. There is no research to say that. However, there's really positive research regarding cannabis and multiple time, multiple kinds of cancer. And that research looks good, but that positive research is not a cure for cancer. Um, I know there are people out there who swear by cannabis. They swear cannabis has kept them alive. They stopped all treatments that it cured them. Um, there's some, something physiologically happening with cannabis, most likely. However, we have no idea what that is. And anytime I hear that, I'm like, no, please talk to your doctor, stay on radiation, stay on chemotherapy. Like, yes, cannabis is great for symptom control, but this cannot, you know, um, and, and why I say, is there a there there? And I, my educated guess is most likely is because, so in laboratories and in animal studies and in some human studies, there's been really positive movement with what perhaps cannabis can do. So in the lab, in a couple studies, um, in a test tube, essentially, cannabis has been known to stop tumor growth to shrink tumors. That's amazing. It has not been done in enough double blind human studies to, to say anything miraculous as cure. Um, there have been human studies where people with radiation and chemotherapy have had really positive outcomes. There was one study I read recently on glioblastoma where they had a pretty good size of a study, like a hundred people use CBD and CBG. CBG is another kind of new, CBG is the next CBD. Um, they gave people that with radiation and chemotherapy. Those people had a terminal diagnosis, I believe, and they outlived their terminal diagnosis by 18 months to two years. That's impressive. Um, we need more studies. That's a great move in the right direction, um, but it certainly does not a cure make. Um, so I know Rick Simpson oil is very, very in, um, very popular, um, and there's a lot of buzz and blogs written on how it cures cancer, um, but no. No, it doesn't. It can help with symptom control, um, which can help get people through their chemotherapy um, and immunotherapy. And sometimes that's enough sometimes to get someone to remission. You know, if you could tolerate your, your treatments with your doctor, um, you know, we kind of say in, in the hospital when I was at the bedside, 
when you stop eating and you stop drinking and you stop moving, that's when bad things happen to our body. Like we physiologically need those things. Um, and cannabis being used as a tool to allow people to continue eating, drinking, and moving the kind of basics of life. Um, if they could, t the longer you could tolerate a treatment, you know, the better chances you have. Um, and so that's where cannabis is a, is a useful tool. So if anyone says it can cure cancer, no, I wish that would be great, but we're not, we're not there yet, but is there tons of potential as cannabis and CBD and isolated cannabinoids as a legit part of a treatment plan? Yes. I, I would bet a thousand dollars right now to anybody willing that as soon as it cannabis is rescheduled within 20 years of rescheduling it, that it will be part of an oncology treatment course. Yes. Um, we're not there yet. And we don't, there's so much we don't know. It is moving in a positive direction though. Great. Um, let's get some specific questions. Does cannabis have a negative interaction with caffeine? Um, I've noticed a cup of coffee with medical cannabis increases my anxiety. I have to look that up. I haven't come up. I could look it up right now. <laughs> I'm really. No, that's okay. We could. Why don't we do that one as one of the, um, the follow-up yeah. ones? I want to make sure um, we get to as many as possible. It depends on products. Again, there are cannabis products out there that also have stimulants in them. Um, you also want to look out for what herbals are mixed with your cannabis. Um, because we're in this very fuzzy place of regulation because of scheduling, um, there are a lot of things, even in a regulated market, that get that happen that shouldn't. Um, there was, I will not name names, but there was a very big grower that had a lot of mold recently in their products. And so for about a month, I had to tell people, like, don't buy this brand right now. You just want to avoid it. Um, kind of same thing. So you, it, I don't think so. I have to look to be sure. I never like kind of guessing. I, I, I always admit when I don't know what I don't know. I haven't seen it come up. It could possibly be something in one of the products that you're taking. Okay. What are your thoughts on creams versus something you can ingest? Um, is it dependent on who you're trying to help? And so for example, somebody said, if I have bad knees and makes it very painful to walk, is it something that can be, can benefit from cannabis? And, and would that, would a cream be better for that? Um, it depends. It depends on you. So if somebody is willing to use ingestible cannabis with topical, usually I recommend going at it in two ways, provides the most relief. You okay. get the systemic kind of stuff that happens with cannabis on that kind of hormonal level with decreased inflammation and pain. Um, topicals are great because you could use quite a bit of topicals. You know, it won't interact systemically, but you get that topical relief. So it depends, um, but both is, is typically fine. Okay, great. Um, how long does it take typically to see progress? Um, so when somebody comes to see you, um, is there a typical time frame? I know, you know, obviously everybody is different. Um, is there a typical time frame that um, if, if to get everybody, each individual to a place where of comfort of potentially joy? Yeah. 50% um, of my client base, and these numbers will probably change as, as everything grows, 50% of folks find relief by that third appointment. Um, usually I would say three or four. So um, usually that's within 30 to 45 days is when many people are on the right track. Um, I joke with people, sorry, chiropractors, I, I don't mean to poke fun. Um, but I often say like, you know, I want to get you on the right track and back to your life. I'm not a chiropractor. You don't have to see me forever. Um, you don't have to see me forever. Um, you know, people will be armed with enough education after a handful of visits that they'll, they'll be able to to do these things on their own. Some won't want to. I do have return clients where, you know, they saw me for stress and then a year has passed and they broke their arm and they, they want help again. Um, and then, you know, folks, I will say folks with really serious chronic illnesses, um, the oncology population, HIV population, um, really severe chronic pain that's hard to treat, um, just the more rare disorders, um, restless leg syndrome. There are a couple of various diagnoses where I know 
early on that they are going to need more than three appointments. The more medications you're on, the more difficult it is to find a dose because I want to be sure with your doctor um, that you're not going to have uncomfortable side effects and that you're not going to have interactions. Um, so three, three to 10 is, is, is still my mean. Um, I do have people that just never want, I, you know, I say that, you know, you don't have to see me forever. I have had patients that, um, they hired me a year ago and they just, they just don't want to use cannabis anymore without education. They'll, they call me for every new product they buy, um, every new sensation they feel they will immediately call me. So, but most people are on the right track pretty fast, like 60, 60 days, 60 to 90. If you have something really complicated, 30, if you have your kind of run of the mill, I feel stress. <laughs> right. Okay. There's one more question that I want to, um, wrap up. What, what we'll do is, um, additional questions that we've received that we haven't been able to get to, we will get them to you and then we'll post them, um, on our site and, and social. Um, can, can you use cannabis if you're on Keytruda? is one of the questions. I have to look, I don't know off the top of my head, I have to look it up. It's, um, I will say it's not one of the meds in my brain where I get like, cause I've been doing this for a while now, there's about five to six where I'm like, Ooh, no, Plavix. I'm like, Ooh, when was your heart attack? Um, other things, uh, there's something called Zyrem, Zywave. That's like a hard no for THC. More research is needed, that's why probably not forever, just for right now. Some synthetic opioids are hard no. There's a medicine for migraines, 5-D-H-E, no cannabis with that. Um, Keytruda, I have to look up. Um, it, it doesn't, yeah, I have to look it up. Okay, so we'll <laughs> get and I wanna, probably, I wanna okay, but I have reiterate to that when somebody comes to see you, you don't, you're not selling products. Um, you, are, you are giving, um, scientific medical advice um, and then giving recommendations and recommendations on various products or um, dispensaries and and where to go. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that we make that distinction. Yeah. And um, I very intentionally, you know, I've been offered, um, please sell my product. No. Um, I do make recommendations and I do have friends in the industry. Um, the cannabis industry is filled with really lovely people. Um, but if I think a product may not be the safest, um, if it doesn't meet high standards of quality, I don't recommend it. Um, I do have a relationship and I give discounts, but yeah, I, I do not make any products. I do not grow any products. Um, if I send someone to a dispensary, 90% of the time it is based on where they live <laughs> and how far they want to commute. Or if a really great product is far away, I send them there. I don't get any kickbacks by sending you to a dispensary in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, I will provide educational content for people, um, for certain companies, but I will only do that for companies that have high quality standards. Um, I, my husband is a physician. He often laughs at me that I was a terrible person to ever open up my own practice um, <laughs> because I have, I could probably be doing great and paying off my student loans. Um, I've had people who are like, I want you to sell my product. And I've been like, I'm sorry, I, I can't write content for you because I, I couldn't give that to any of my patients. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, so my primary goal in my, um, my interest is, is the patient, um, and not moving product. And that's how, why you should seek out a cannabis nurses, because, um, there's great people in the cannabis industry more often than not, everyone has good intentions because we all want to sleep at night. Um, but you have to keep an eye. There are people out there who want to make fast money. Um, and there's a way to do it in the cannabis industry. So you do have to kind of there's some bad actors kind of ruining it for, the, <laughs> for everyone else. Um, but that's what you hire me or my other colleagues for um, is, to, is to figure that out. And then also I want to address a comment um, and I just about RSO again. And so I'm not saying that cannabis can never, you know, in the future be able to cure anything. Um, but I am, I only like to say what I see scientifically. Um, I think that's really important when we're trying to destigmatize cannabis and work with physicians. Um, 
it's already a struggle sometimes to get physicians on board with cannabis because they're not comfortable. They have a DEA license that they don't want to mess around with because of the federal restriction, their license is DEA. I'm licensed by the state. Um, so I have, it's legal in Illinois. I have room to educate on cannabis and the higher nursing board says that I can do that. But if I, if a doctor sees me saying something that's scientifically not accurate or not based in research, they're going to walk away from cannabis for forever. Um, I do have a no judgment zone with clients and patients where um, I'm not going to push anybody towards what they're uncomfortable with. Um, I provide the research. I provide the evidence that we have so far. Um, and I, you know, I want to support my patients in whatever they do, but I also, it is my ethical responsibility to say what the research says. And so um, it's not that I don't believe in cannabis and I don't believe that there's a lot of things that are very truly happening to patients. Uh, I believe those patients and I do believe cannabis is causing a positive physiological change, but I, you just can't, you can't say it until it's there. Um, and so um I just wanted to kind of go back to that because I do not, you know, I have seen, you know, I have seen cool things. The blood pressure effect, people weaning off their blood pressure medications. There is not strong literature on that. There's a couple studies that say it, but it's not, you know, it's not something we could start practicing. You know, the hospital is not going to start giving people CBD. Maybe in 20 years they will. I hope they do. I think it, again, I would bet a hundred dollars on that too, uh, but I can't say it. Um, I could talk about it though. I could say, this is what I've seen. And, and, you know, like the gentleman said in, in the chat, sorry, and I, I don't know your pronouns, so I'm, I'm guesstimating. Um, but, um, are people seeing really positive things with cannabis? Yes. Um, we just don't have enough data to name it yet. So sure. I believe sure. we, we appreciate that. And we, you know, that's why we're, we're, we're talking with you tonight is because you're coming with the hard facts and the data and um, that's really important. So thank you for that. And thank you for, for this talk. I mean, it was so informative and, and such useful, useful and important information for our entire community, whether it's patients, caretakers, um, you know, as somebody joining in because they, they know of us. Um, you know, there's, there's so much insight here and a lot of questions are still coming in. So we will, um, we will continue the conversation offline and be sure to get the information out. What's the best place that people could reach out to you? What's, what's your website? So oh, my website is www.acuteonchronic.com and it's getting updated. So it's going to look really cool in like two weeks. Um, you could reach me there, my email. Um, you could email admin, A-D-M-I-N at acuteonchronic.com for any information that you might like. Um, and then we're on Facebook, Acute on Chronic Facebook, Acute on Chronic Twitter. I think I'm Acute on Chronic rn420 on instagram tiktok coming soon you could find me on linkedin um you could google me and call me if you google illinois cannabis nurse chicago cannabis nurse i pop up it's easy i'm currently the only only one <laughs> so you'll find me um but please tell people about me um i i have a lot of my business is referral based i'm happy to partner with any dispensary out there, um, your sales, it will be better with a cannabis nurse because you will have repeat clientele because they will feel better and feel like there is a trusted source to come to. Um, I do see a lot of people will go to the dispensary and they have a bad time and then they're like, oh, never again. And with science, you minimize that. So I'm happy to partner and talk with any reputable companies out there too. So yeah. Communication and education, it's, it's what uh, it's about. Uh, so thank you again, Rebecca. We really appreciate it. If you are joining us on the replay, please go ahead and write replay in the comments and add your questions in there. And we'll continue that um, to get those to Rebecca. I hope you'll join us next month. So on July 21st, we're going to be bringing back Dina Goldberg from Dina DNA. And we're going to be talking about um, genetic counseling versus genetic testing. You know, with all the 23andMe and the different um, testings that's out there, the information that we think we're receiving versus what we're receiving is, is quite different. So um, we definitely um, hope that you'll be able to join us for that. The, the link for registration um, is going to be in the chat. And if you have future ideas for Wellness Wednesday, 
additions, please email us at info at ralphfoundation.org. Sign up for Dash for um, Dashing Together virtually. And on behalf of everyone at Ralph Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you have a great rest of the evening, um, that you continue to stay safe and take good care. And we will see you next time. Thank you.